Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third installment of the Naturalist Notes webinar series. My name is Susie Fortner. I'm the Programs and Operations Director with Friends of the Dunes. My pronouns are she and her. Hi, everyone. My name is Daisy Ambris Perez, and um, I am the Outreach Manager of Friends of the Dunes, and my pronouns are she, her. I would like to start by acknowledging um, the environments that Friends of the Dunes is working to conserve are located in the unceded territory of the Wiat people, which includes the Wiat tribe, Bear River Rancheria, and Blue Lake Rancheria. Wiat people continue to be stewards of the coastal environment surrounding Wigi, Humboldt Bay, as they have been since time immemorial, including Wadal, the coastal dunes located between Wigi and Shore, the Pacific Ocean. Um, one of the ways in which we can honor our placement within Wiat territory is by recognizing the original names of these places that we call home, as well as the native plants and animals of these places. Names that have existed long before the violent colonization of this area and attempted erasure of indigenous cultures and knowledge. For each webinar, we are introducing a Wiat word of the day. Today's word is Jokjugash, which is Wiat for flying squirrel. Um, and that might be confusing because we're talking about lichens this evening. Um, however, it will become more clear later in the presentation. In case you aren't familiar with Friends of the Dunes, um, we are a nonprofit organization dedicated to conserving the natural diversity of coastal environments through community supported education and stewardship programs. Um, this time I'm highlighting a picture of our Humboldt Coastal Nature Center because I have some exciting news. Um, which is that we are planning to reopen the Nature Center soon. Um, it'll actually be the first time it's been open since the pandemic started back um, in March of 2020 when we closed the doors to the public. So we're really excited about that. Um, keep an eye out on our social media feed um, and our email updates if you get those. Um, if you don't get those, it's easy to sign up for them on our website at friendsofthedunes.org or contact us at info at Friends of the Dunes and we'll get you signed up. Um, thank you to everybody for being here. Um, thank you for supporting Friends of the Dunes. All of the proceeds raised through this webinar series are going to support our coastal naturalist training, um, which will be taking place in the fall, September through October. And that coastal naturalist training is a California naturalist certification program. Um, so we are really looking forward to doing that. I'm pretty hopeful that we'll be able to do the entire thing in person, fingers crossed on that. Um, so keep an eye out for those details. It will be starting on September 9th and I will have uh, more information up on our website very soon. So thank you for supporting this webinar series. Thank you for being here. Um, if you want to pitch in more funding for the Coastal Naturalist Training Scholarships, we would always appreciate that and you can donate more on our website. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Daisy. Yeah, so thank you everyone for joining Friends of the Dunes um, for our very first webinar series. We have an exciting um, line of engaging uh, presenters for the next few weeks, um, and you can see those on your screen. So I'm just gonna go over a quick um, couple housekeeping items. So please feel free to communicate amongst yourselves uh, within the chat. Please remember to toggle who you're sending the chat message to. You can do this by pushing on the blue button at the bottom of your chat box. Make sure that it says panelists and attendees if you want everyone to see your message. Um, if you have questions to the presenter, please make sure that you type those into the Q&A rather than um, in the chat box. That way it could be easier for us to find um, the questions later on. Um, you can also control your view of the presentation. At the moment, um, you, hopefully you are seeing me, seeing me next to the slides. Um, you can control how big my face is versus how big the slides are by dragging the bar that divides us. Um, you can also hide the video feed altogether and only view the slides. I believe that control is on your top right corner. Um, last but not least, these webinars will be recorded and we will send you the link to the video within the next few days. Um, so without further ado, I would like to welcome our presenter, L'Oreal Caverly, a certified botanist, a naturalist, botanist, and lichen enthusiast. Hi. 
Hi, thank you. Really nice to be here. I'm really excited to be part of this um, workshop, this webinar. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for being here, L'Oreal. We're excited to have you and excited to learn more about lichens. Yeah. Shall I, shall I go ahead and share my screen? Yes, please do. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna do a little presenter view. All right, um, thanks so much, Susie and Daisy. Really appreciate that welcome. And I'm super happy to be here. I'm really honored that uh, Friends of the Dunes asked me to participate and share my enthusiasm um, about lichens of, of this wonderful area. So I am nervous. This is the first time I've done a, a webinar like this on Zoom. And so hopefully I don't forget everything I know, but just bear with me and we'll get through it together. So today we're talking about lichens of Malel and Lanfear Dunes, and my name is L'Oreal Caverly. And let's look at where we're talking about. And I, I do first kind of want to zoom out and let you know that I'm coming to you. I'm in Fort Bragg right now um, on a work trip, and this is the ancestral land of the northern Pomo people. And unfortunately, I don't know too much about that, um, but I just want to offer my respect to those people. And I also, I do live in Gudene, which is also known as Arcata. And um, as, as you may know, it's the ancestral and current home of the Wiat, as well as areas around the Humboldt Bay. And I just want to give a lot of a big respect for their stewardship of this land since time immemorial. And last week, Adam Cantor gave a really great talk and he recommended the Wiat tribal website for his language resources. So I've been going on there and, and learning some words and listening to the recordings. And um, I apologize for any mispronunciations, but I'll, I'm, I'm trying, I've been practicing a little bit. So let me turn my pointer on. All right, so we are talking about lichens in the dune forest along here. And this is the strand of coastal dunes between shore the Pacific Ocean and Wei Gay, the Humboldt Bay. And you can see here the Friends of the Dunes Visitor Center is there and that's really exciting news. They'll be opening back up soon, hopefully, fingers crossed. And then there's the Malel North Trailhead. The trail goes along here and then the Lanfear Dunes Trailhead and the, that those trails go along in this area. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to share the satellite image because it shows this really neat thing. If you're a geomorphology nerd like I am, you'll enjoy this, but it shows the, the parabolic dunes. And so these dunes have a parabola shape on their leading edge, which is inland. And that's a result of the winds blowing during the dry season, which is the summertime, the winds blow from the Northwest. And so they get this sort of Northwest to Southeast shape with the parabola on the leading edge. And I was just out there last week at Malel, and man, this dune is getting so close to the trail. It's feet from the trail. So that'll be interesting to see how that uh, turns out in a few more years. I wonder if we'll just be hiking over the dune as it spills into the uh, slough here. So let me move on. Oh, I just, I do wanna share also that this, this forest is a really dynamic system because the dunes are constantly moving it's, you know, there, there are mature for, there is mature forest and there are, you know, moving dunes. There are stabilized dunes with amazing plant biology going on there. And there are even wetlands where the, where the wind has blown the sand down to the um, water table. So we have wetlands forming and then new forests forming in those wetlands. So it's a really cool dynamic system. So let's get into the lichens. Uh, starting off, I wanted to introduce you to Peltigera Britannica, the flaky freckle pelt. This is a really beautiful, stunning lichen. And it's, it's I think, maybe going to be our model organism for the talk. And I wanted to use it to introduce you to a couple of um, lichen anatomy features. And you'll, you may see that on the bottom left, I have a few vocabulary words to help familiarize us with um, with how to talk about lichens. And I did, 
I do want to share with you that I'm also structuring the talk similar to um, the lichen walks that I've taken people on in the past. Um, I guess I should mention, give a quick shout out to the Coast Naturalist class. I'm glad uh, Susie mentioned that earlier. I took that a few years ago. It was an awesome experience, big plug for that. Definitely worth your time. If anybody's thinking about doing it, I highly recommend it. And um, that's where I learned how to give lichen walks and um, how to help interpret the natural world around us to people who are interested. And so I wanted to structure this talk kind of like the lichen walks where we're looking at lichens and talking about them rather than front loading you with all the heady lichen technology in the beginning. Let's put it you know, all throughout while we're looking at these beautiful photos. So I have vocab here. Um, the first word we'll talk about is thallus, and that's the body of the lichen. And, um, you know, we don't call it a leaf or a stem because it's not a plant and that's not what those parts are. So this is the thallus of the lichen and they're all the parts of them have their own um, names. And I guess when I say them, the lichen, I should also share this. This may be uh, new information for some people and review for others, but just a reminder that lichens are, are composite organisms that exist in a symbiosis. And there are multiple organisms involved in that symbiosis. And so here we're looking at um, at least three different species and there are other microbes involved too. So um, let's see, let's talk more about the, we have thallus and then also on top, these little structures are called cephalodia. On the underside, those are rhizines. And then the other term here is cortex. So that's the upper surface in this case. On many lichens, the cortex is covering the entire lichen. On this one, it lacks a lower cortex. And that's where the rhizines are attached. And those rhizines are really only for attachment. They don't provide any, they're not like roots where they bring water and nutrients into the organism. They just are to help stabilize the lichen. So let's look at a couple more pictures of this beautiful Peltigera Britannica. And this is a sneak peek of the reindeer lichen that we'll talk about later. But uh, I wanna share that the Peltigera Britannica does live at both Lanfear and Malel, and it can be found on the um, kind of the benches along the trails. And it's really only visible in the wet season. I mean, it's visible during the dry season, but it's super easy to miss because as soon as it dries out, that bright green cortex turns immediately to a pale brown. And the lobes of the thallus, like in this photo here on the bottom left, they'll curl under. It's, it's starting to do that and they'll curl in. And so it's just like this brown, gray, you know, pale, and you can barely see it. I've walked by it many times and forgot to check on it. Um, and I also, unfortunately, don't have a photo of it in that state because it's, it's so sort of hidden during that season. So to talk about the lichen biology a little bit, let's imagine we're taking a cross section of one of these thallus lobes, making a really thin slice and then laying on its side and looking at it through a microscope. And this is uh, similar to what we might see. And so some more vocab terms here to keep talking about, help us keep talking about lichens. Um, two very important ones are photobiont and mycobiont. And so we talked about it being a symbiosis. So the photobiont would be the symbiotic partner that does the photosynthesis. So in this case, um, we're looking at some green algae, but there's also cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae, but I try to just stick with cyanobacteria because blue-green algae is, not, is a pretty bad misnomer because it's not an algae at all, or not an alga at all. So inside the lichen, we have um, the photobiont layer, and those algal cells are photosynthesizing, producing sugars, you know, capturing carbon dioxide and using sunlight and water to turn that CO2 into chains of um, carbohydrates and sugars. And so they're sitting there photosynthesizing. And then the mycobiont, the fungal partner who's down here and up here has the hyphae. Oh, I didn't put that on there, sorry. But it's, it's the fungal strands. The hyphae are all intertwined with that algae and they're absorbing and taking up the sugars that they produce and then using that energy to build their bodies. And there's, you can see the cortex on top here. 
there's a rising in the cross section down here. And here's a little cartoon illustration I did to show there's the cephalodia on top. And this lichen is super special because it's a tripartite lichen. And um, in the cephalodia live the cyanobacteria and then in the body live the green algae. And three more terms on this slide that I'll get to and then we'll move on to another organism. Um, there are three main classifications of lichen and it doesn't have to do with how necessarily how well related they are, but um, they just help us talk about the different types. So this, this Peltigera britannica that we just saw is a folios lichen, meaning it's leaf-like, it has a top and a bottom, and then there are also fruticose and crustose lichens, and we'll see some of those later. So let's move on here. This is not a lichen, but it is a very important component. This is Trentopolia, which is a free living green alga. And it's, a, it's filamentous and colonial. So it's, they're a little, I don't know if you can see, this is a 10 times magnified through my hand lens photo. And there are little strands of algae living together. And they create this red pigment to protect themselves from the sun, or I should say they produce the red pigment. And this is found living, this is at Landfair Dunes and on the stairs going up to an office and um, right around the corner is one of the trails I really like starting my hikes on. And I like to walk by and say hi to the Trentopolia um, because it's a common photobiont in many crustose lichens, but here it is free living. And it's right on the railing, as you can see, zooming in. So um, happy to say hi to Trentopolia when I go on my, my hikes. You can also find it living on the sides of trees um, where I am now on the Mendocino coast, especially on the Monterey Cypress, right on the right on the coastal cliffs, there will be just big thick layers of this red orange Trentopolia um, on the north side of the trees. All right, another lichen. This is Hypogymnia. Uh, this is just a Hypogymnia species. I'm sorry, I don't know the the exact identity uh, because they are hard. Hypogymnia are, are kind of hard to identify without chemical tests. And I didn't have an opportunity to perform chemical tests on this one, um, but it is a great example. It's a very reliable lichen that you'll see on many walks. So anyone in the Humboldt Bay area or any kind of forested area, you will, if you go on a quick walk in, in the forest, you're likely to see hypogymnia, the tube lichen. And this one is showing off a new vocab word for us today. It's apothecia. And that's these, sort of light brown discs or cups on the structure. And that is where sexual reproduction happens on behalf, on, by, by the fungus, I should say. So that's where the fungal spores are produced and released. And this lichen lives normally in trees and on older shrubs, but this photo is showing it on the ground. And um, I wanted to show that because a great way to, to go lichenizing is to go out after a big storm when the wind's been blowing a lot and you can find fallen branches and chunks of lichen everywhere. So it's a great time to go out hiking, looking for lichen. Let's see, what else about this do I want to share with you? I do wanna let you know also that um, lichens live all on all seven continents and they range from really hardy lichens that can withstand extreme temperature variations um, to being very sensitive. So some of the lichens we have here in Humboldt, um, we have very high diversity here luckily because we have such clean air and lichens are very sensitive to air pollution. So some of them can't stand air pollution. Some of them can handle a little bit more. So let's move on to the next lichen. This, these are still folios lichens, and this is another one of my favorite. Um, in this one, the photosynthetic partner is a cyanobacteria. And most of them, I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but most of the cyanobacteria um, containing lichens as the primary photobiont have this sort of gray green coloration. So that's kind of a neat thing, and I find them pretty and kind of spooky looking. So this is Peltigera canina with uh, orange apothecia. And you can see it has really bushy risings here. And this one also grows um, similar habitat to the Peltigera britannica, the flaky freckle pelt, 
Um, this lives on the sides of, you know, you can find it on the sides of trails. It, there's a lot of them on the old wooden steps at both Malel and Lanfear on the sort of side of the step and grows in with the mosses, as you can see. And these are apothecia, these uh, orange, brown, they have a different shape, but they do the same, they provide the same function. So another one, which is, you know, in this photo, it doesn't look super similar, but they are, they can be pretty hard to tell apart. This one happens to be a light brown, and I think it might have been starting to dry out, which why it, which is why it's not as gray. But in this, this is another of the same genus, Peltidra membranacea. And this one's showing off its thin rope-like risings. And it has the same um, apothecia, very similar looking. And uh, you can look at that specific epithet, the second part of the name, Peltidra membrana. It's, I think the common name is membranous dog tooth lichen or membranous dog lichen. And it, you see the light passing through in this photo. So I thought that was a good example to show the sort of membranous nature of it. It's thin. But here's a third one, which looks a lot more like the first one we talked about, the Peltidra canina. It has the darker, sort of thicker looking thallus. It still has the same orange apothecia. But if you flip it over, you get to see it has thin rope-like rising. So which one is it? I'm pretty sure this is the Peltidra membranacea, but I do want to run it through the key, so don't hold me to it if I'm wrong about that ID. But those, I just wanted to share that to express the importance of looking at the risings if you're trying to identify them. So there are all these interesting characteristics um, to help you tell the different lichens apart. Oh, this next one is a very important uh, California lichen. And I don't know if you know, but we have a state lichen, the Remolina menziesii, the California lace lichen. And this is the official state lichen. Um, it's just very beautiful. And um, in this photo, it's actually the same one as my background. I don't know if I'm blocking the tree, but there is a, a tree here. This is from a kayak out in the, um, the slough next to Malel. And it's just covered in ramelina. And here's another photo of it draping from the trees. And it's called lace lichen because it forms these lace like structures. And you can see that in this photo here. In Humboldt County and in the North Coast, the ramelina lace are very small and hard to see. But if you go down to the Central Coast, like Carmel Valley area, especially in the oak woodlands, they, you, you can find huge, thick, chunky lace structures on the ramelina. And this I want this is a good example of um, habitat that lichens provide. So it's it's very thick and it ends up being an excellent habitat for invertebrates all along tree branches. Also if you have an old apple tree in your yard, it will be covered with various lichens. Same thing, tons of little invertebrates from springtails to spiders mites, um, insects, etc., like to live in there. And then it becomes great foraging habitat for birds or any other critter that likes to eat invertebrates. I'll let you take a look at this lichen while I grab a sip of my tea. This is Cladonia massalenta, the lipstick powder horn. And it's a very cool like, and I'm sure some of you have seen this before. It really pops out with that bright red. And you might guess that that's the, the apothecia. And so that's where the spores are being produced. And I found this on a horizontal log at Lanfear that was laying down and it just had created this beautiful community. Um, I can just imagine being a little critter hopping through there and it's just the, the coolest microcosm. And I've always wished I could pull a honey, I shrunk the kids moment and be as small to run around in there. Hopefully that's not too dated of a reference for some people. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so we have a couple ways of, well, I guess let's talk about the, um, the terms here. So in these type, of these type of cladonia species, we have podicia, which are the vertical structures that stick up. And there are also squamules, and you can't really see them in this photo. They're pretty small, but
but they're, I just really love the word, which is why I included it. The squamules are very tiny leaf-like structures and they can be just loads of them on the substrate right below. And that's part of the same lichen. And sometimes the squamules can even be up the side of the podicia, a few here and there. And the third term I have on here is a really important to lichen reproduction is soridia. And that's that powdery stuff that you see on the side. In some lichens, it comes out of the margin. There will be special structure where it'll sort of, the cortex will burst open and the powder of the ceridia are just there ready to be dispersed by wind or whatever. But they, I like to call ceridia uh, lichens to go. And it's, it's basically, instead of a spore, it's a whole packet of, there'll be a hand, you know, handful, maybe a few algal cells and a few strands of hyphae of the fungal material. So be the photosynthetic partner and the um, fungal partners, the photobiont and mycobiont wound up together in a neat little package ready to disperse. And so a bird hopping along or an insect crawling by will pick up a little tiny piece of this powder, a speck of powder. And if it ends up in a place with favorable conditions, it's ready to go. It starts, you know, the the hyphae, the fungal hyphae can start growing and supporting the algae to reproduce and it then can build a whole new lichen. And if you contrast that with the spore coming out of the apothecia, the spore is just the fungal partner. And so if that gets dispersed on the wind or ho however, and it lands in a place that has favorable conditions, it still has to land close enough to a potential algal partner to survive. Because once that spore generates, it has no way to get nutrition, no way to get food or energy, except from a, a um, photobiont partner. So it's kind of SOL if it, if it germinates far away. Um, so let's see, I think that's it on this slide. Let's go on to the next one. Oh yes, one of my favorite. This is Ferrophorus tuckermanii, the coral lichen. And I just included it because it's one of the most beautiful lichens in my opinion. You can see, oh, and I did forget to mention that we've now moved into the fruticose lichens, the shrub-like ones. So it's not leaf-like anymore. It's more shrubby. It doesn't have a distinct top and bottom. So fruticose is shrubby. And this cladonia is also fruticose, as is the coral lichen. So you can see the cortex is this beautiful peach color and it wraps all the way around this gorgeous branching. And it very much does look like coral you might find under the sea. And I found in, in just my observations, and I don't know this for, for sure, but I feel like this lichen is super specific of from where it lives. I've only ever found it on the sides of tree trunks between like three and six foot height. It always seems to be within like I can kneel down easily to look at it with my hand lens or sometimes it's right at eye level which I appreciate I think the lichen for being easy to look at and let's talk about where lichens live a little bit more so they can live on the ground on rocks on fences on your house on you know on trees if they are on your fruit trees or your your trees on your property please know that lichens do not hurt plants they never take anything away from the plant, except for, you know, not even except for, they add to it. Then they can be a sign of a healthy environment. If you have a high diversity of lichens, that means you have good air quality and the like. Um, and they do contribute to plant health by um, the, those with cyanobacteria, they take atmospheric nitrogen and they turn it into a form of nitrogen that plants can use. And nitrogen is something that plants often have in limited supply. And so by providing that to the environment, they can increase the overall health. And they also help with um, water regulation by you know, slowing down the drying cycles by holding onto water. Mosses are really good at that too, but we're talking about lichens today. Um, let's move on to the next slide. Another fruticose lichen, this is an Usnea species. And Usnea is notoriously hard to identify. So I didn't even try with this one. And, um, but they are very well known for 
being useful medicine and uh, humans have been using them for a long time, I'm sure. Um, I remember when I first moved up to Humboldt hearing about a tincture a local herbalist made called Humboldt Hackaway. And it was for this like the cough that people get in Humboldt, who knows why, but um, Usnia is very good for respiratory health. And so it's still in many tinctures for, for such purposes. And um, it's a really neat like, and I have one more species of Usnia to show you next, but I want to point out, I have a, another vocab word on here, which is Isidia. And Isidia are very similar to Ceridia, except they're not a powder, they're more of a large structure. So in this zoom in, it's very small, but you know, these are the branches. But in between those branches, you can see those little dots. And those are Isidia, and they can very easily break off and disperse, and they, they're lichens to go, just like Ceridia. So the next one is another Usnia, and this one is the easiest Usnia to identify because of its bright red color, Usnia rubicunda. And this is the red beard lichen, and easily found um, at both Malel and Lanfear dunes. And it, I'm showing you here a really cool feature of Usnia that you can all take away from this talk today. If you want to know if a lichen species isn't Usnia, you can give one of the stems, a gentle, I'm, I should not have said stems, but one of the uh, branches of the thallus, a gentle tug and the cortex will crack and you then, then will see a stretchy central cord. And it's kind of like elastic. And so this, I've just gently pulled it apart. Um, I don't recommend going around and tugging on all the lichens, but if you find some litter fall on the trail and you wanna, you think, oh, this kind of looks like an usnia. And if you give it a tug and it just snaps, well, maybe it's a ramelina or some other species. But if it just the cortex cracks and you get the little stretchy cord, you know for sure it's an Usnia species. I couldn't leave out the crustose lichens. I almost did, but I put this slide in last minute because they're so cool. Um, and one thing that many people don't know, but so many trees are just covered in them. So all the white on here and many of the other gray colors are all lichens. And a lot of people think, you know, alder trees are just these beautiful white modeled, have this beautiful white modeled bark, but it's actually lichens growing all over them. And this is a red alder at Malel. Oh, someone else is hiding in the background here. There's some Ramelina menziesii dangling from the tree, probably loaded with little spiders and mites and happy hopping critters. But all over this tree, you can see, um, I'll introduce you to two crustose lichens. There's the Pertisaria species. And I didn't, I don't know which species it is, but this is the powder sugar lichen. And that name is a little bit of a joke. And I don't know if I want to spoil the joke for someone else, but if someone suggests that you lick this powder sugar lichen and says it might be sweet, you can see how much you trust them and how good of a friend they are once you give it a lick and find out what it actually tastes like. And then the second one is Ocrolechia, um, and also not identified to species. This is the genus Ocrolechia, and this is the pumpkin pie lichen, and you can kind of see why. This photo is through a, um, a microscope, not a hand lens. So I think this is probably about 20 times magnification. So that's my only slide on crustose lichens. And we're nearing the end of um, the end of the talk, but I have a few more slides for you. And the next one I I couldn't leave out a very important lichen to the dunes is, and hopefully it's the timing of the slides is matching up with my talking. This is Cladonia portentosa, subspecies Pacifica, the maritime reindeer lichen. And what a special lichen this is! It grows um, on the ground in these puffy patches. Sometimes it looks like piled up snow. It always gives me really strong winter vibes. And it's, it's so interesting because when it's moist out, if you gently touch it, and please do be gentle if you want to touch this lichen, it will be very spongy. But when the, the next day you can go and it will be dry and it's like this crisp, hard structure. It's quite interesting. And in this first photo, you can see it's, mi it's mixed in with the, uh, the lichen we started with, the Peltigera britannica, and some Arctostaphylus uva ursi, the kinnikinnik or bearberry, 
It's a little plant shrub. I've got a couple more slides here. Um, and it's called reindeer lichen. There are many species of reindeer lichen. And it's called this because in the northern latitudes, the reindeer eat this lichen as their primary winter forage. And there's a lot going on with um, the health of the reindeer and, and them eating this lichen. And I believe it has a lot to do with all the secondary chemicals, which I haven't really gotten into, but lichens do produce a wide array of chemicals that are can be useful for many purposes or just are amazing that they exist in their own right. This photo shows a bit of the Cladonia um, portentosa after it had been knocked out of its habitat and I set it back. Um, it had been sort of maybe some animal had been digging through and I kind of wanted to put this on as a reminder that when we visit Malel, it's so sensitive there that my, I just got a, a notification, my internet connection's unstable, so I apologize if I'm breaking up, but hopefully not. Um, but the lichens are so sensitive that if a dog runs through it or anyone steps on it, it can really cause a lot of damage and it takes a long time for these things to recover. So just a reminder to be gentle when you're out there and, and never bring dogs to those two places although we love our doggies. So last slide of um, the same lichen, the uh, subspecies portentosa, Clodonia portentosa subspecies pacifica rather. This one's through my hand lens and um, I was super excited because I think I might have found apothecia on this. I'm not positive, it could be a different structure, but this is the first time I've seen those little rounded brown, uh, rounded brown structures on the end of the branches. So just wanted to share that beauty. And um, on my last slide, I wanna share something really cool. And this is finally tying back in the we out word of the day. Um, and I listened to a recording earlier to make sure I got it. So hopefully I don't mess it up too much, but Jupjugach, I think is how to pronounce it, is um, also known as the flying squirrel, this little cutie. And it interrelates with Bryoria species, which is a hair, the hair lichen. And they kind of are unassuming lichens. They're easy to miss. They're kind of just brown and fade into the background, but they're very cool. And the flying squirrel uses Bryoria to build its nest. And so they're cavity nesters. So inside old growth trees in an old rotted out hole, they'll collect lots of Bryoria and fill up their nest cavity. And then they have their babies, I think maybe in the fall. And throughout the winter, while they're nursing their babies, they eat the Bryoria. And so that's their food. Of course, they keep their nest clean, I'm sure in some ways, but the Bryoria becomes their, their food that while they're nursing their babies. So basically Bryoria is nursing baby Jupjugach, flying squirrel. And so, um, and that also ties in with the endangered uh, Northern spotted owl because spotted owl eat flying squirrel. And if we don't have flying squirrel, we don't have uh, spotted owls. So we need to preserve Bryoria too. And so thank you all so much. This is my last slide. Um, I'm really grateful to that you've all taken the time to listen to my excitement about lichens today. I wanna thank uh, Friends of the Dunes and the Coast Naturalist course. And Marie Antoine is was a professor at HSU who taught me about lichens and really got me um, even more excited about them. And um, all my Naturalist Walk participants who have gone on walks with me and helped me learn how to talk about these amazing organisms, as well as all my friends who have also let me talk their ears off about lichens. So thank you so much. That was great. Thank you, L'Oreal. I learned so many new vocabulary words <laughs> this evening. Um, I mean, I just have to say that lichen vocabulary words and lichen names are really just like very exciting stuff. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm curious to hear, I didn't, I forgot to ask a question to our participants earlier in the webinar. So 
Um, if anybody has any favorite vocabulary words they learned um, this evening, I would love to hear what those are in the chat. Remember to toggle between um, to panelists and attendees so we can all see your answers. And I'm gonna have to say that mine, my favorite word is also squamules. Um, that's a pretty good one. It was good. Um, great. Yeah, and thank you for bringing up the dogs. Um, there are these places that you're showing, Malel Dunes um, and Lanfear Dunes. Malel North and Lanfear, we do not allow dogs on the trails. Um, those are both managed by the Humboldt Bay National Wildlife Refuge um, and they're protected wildlife areas, so dogs are not allowed. But Malel South does also have some pretty good lichens um, and that is managed by the BLM and dogs are allowed. And if you have dogs and you're wondering where to go, Friends of the Dunes has this really awesome brochure um, and map showing where you can take your dogs um, out to coastal areas. Okay, we're, um, let's see, I think maybe we'll stop sharing your screen, L'Oreal, so we can have all of our faces here in gallery view. Um, or actually people might be seeing us one at a time, but that works too. And um, we've got some questions over here in the Q&A. Um, I definitely have a few more that I wrote down um, if we don't have any more, but if you do have questions, please go ahead and type those into the Q&A um, and we will get started. This evening, we are gonna be trying to end right about at 8 p.m. Um, or a couple minutes after, but um, we wanna respect L'Oreal's time and um, not go too far over our time limit tonight. <laughs> so let's, oh wow, those questions really popped. It was four last time I left, looked and now there's 10 questions. So we'll go ahead and jump into that. Um, Daisy, do you wanna start? Sure. Um, okay, so Steph Morian asked, uh, are there any pathogens that affect lichens? Yes, there are. Um, there actually are, are fungi, fungal pathogens. I think they're called lichenicolous fungi. And so if you ever see a lichen that's looking kind of is one of the ways you can see it's it likely is being attacked by a lichenicolous fungi. And there may be others, but that's, those are the main ones. Well, you're breaking up a little bit now, L'Oreal. We had you pretty good for the presentation. I but... know about. Oh, okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. So I, shall I answer the question again? Um, may, yeah, maybe repeat the the signs of it. I think we kind of missed that part. Yeah, um, lichenicolous fungi are, you know, fungi that attack lichens and you can see them, um, if the lichen is looking pink, a little pink and discolored, it's one of the ways you can see, and it might have spots on it, pink to brown to black is, are some of the signs of that they're being munched on by a different fungus. Cool, thank you. Thanks for repeating that. We did miss yeah. the, the color part of it. Okay, um, from Natalia, where can we find most of these lichens in Humboldt County? So these, all the lichens that I showed today are photos that I took at Malel and Lanfear Dunes. And um, so if you, if you get, if you go on a walk, uh, Friends of the Dunes organizes walks to Lanfear Dunes, and then you can get a permit after you've attended an introductory walk, and you can have permission to go walk at Lanfear um, by yourself. But you can also go without a permit to Malel North and walk along that trail and do, I think it's called DAP Loop, D-A-P. And that has most of these lichens on there. I think all of them are on that trail as well. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> I was muted for a second. Um, Denise Seeger asks, are lichens beneficial to a tree even if they're dead on the branch? I wonder if, if you're saying if if the lichens are dead on, um, on a dead branch, she said. Oh, if the yes, because the way they're beneficial is by um, providing extra nutrients into the soil, and so when it rains, the all the nutrients that are in the lichens kind of get washed through and down to the soil. So if you want to leave that dead branch on, I recommend it. Great, thank you. 
um, I just trimmed up my apple tree a little while ago and was really sad to cut off a branch that had lichens on it. I'm gonna leave it in my yard somewhere. Good idea. <laughs> I've been there. Um, <laughs> okay, so from Steph, um, does the red beard lichen have apothecia in the close up or is this just a very warty texture? Warty. Oh yeah, that, great question. Those, um, I think those were, cause I took that photo actually with an old lichen I had collected from Litterfall, not at Lanfear and Malel from, you know, private property, but um, I wanted to take a photo for this talk. So I went out and found one. It was in one of my flower pots and it was half dead and being probably eaten by Lichenicholus fungi. And so I re-moistened it to get that, um, to show the stretchy central cord but I believe all those little warty bumps were where branches had broken off. And Usnia don't have, don't show um, apothecia as often as some of the other species or some of the other genera, I should say. Um, but you can find there are a couple, there are a couple local species of Usnia that sometimes will have apothecia and they're really cool. There'll be a flat disc with like, those same kind of branches. It, it looks crazy because there'll be a circle with all these wild branches sticking off the rim, kind of like a psychedelic sun or something. Okay, um, Natalia asks, uh, what lichens can we consume? That is a good question. I think lichen extracts are the most common ways that we'll consume lichens. There are a few that um, have been eaten, but they're more like famine foods. So there's one that I didn't show because it doesn't occur down here, but um, umbelicaria is one of them. It's a rock tripe, grows on rocks at higher elevations. That's one that people do consume, um, but I don't think it's super delicious. So I think it's more of a, something to eat when we don't have enough really yummy food. But I think usnea in tinctures, there's actually a toothpaste um, Kiss My Face makes a toothpaste that has um, Cetraria Icelandica in it, also known as Iceland moss, but that's a lichen. And it has some healthy whitening, maybe, <laughs> property. Cool, thank you. Um, okay, so I've got several questions about how to identify lichens. One from Christian. So the gypsum is for plants. What would someone use to identify key lichens? And then from Miles, is there a good, um, is there a good lichen reference or key you can recommend? Yeah, that is tricky. There aren't the greatest um, books on lichens, but there is a one website that is I would recommend called Ways of Enlightenment. So <laughs> it's like enlightenment, but spell put lichen in there. Um, and I bet if you were to do a search engine on that, you even if you spelled it wrong, you could probably find it. And um, you could spend some time on there. There's loads of photos. It's a huge, there's a photo guide. There also, I have actually the two books. I wish I could show you, but my laptop is sitting on them right now. <laughs> but I did bring my large, um, Lichens of North America was a gift I got myself when I got my first um, well-paying job. <laughs> and that is a very, very large reference book. And it covers um, most of North America. Unfortunately, they excluded Mexico, which is North America, but it's, it's the United States and Canada. And it's a very good reference guide. And there is an accompanying key that um, you can buy separately. And they up, the, the book is a little bit dated now, but the key has been updated. Um, there's also macro lichens of the Pacific Northwest. The second edition has some great descriptions um, and it's useful. And then the third book, Sharnoff, and it might be by Stephen Sharnoff also. I'm sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head. But uh, yeah, Calv like in another more recent one. And that's it that I can think of. Okay, you did freeze up a little bit there um, around the end of the second book and beginning of the third book. Let's see, I can't tell if you're frozen right now. <laughs> Am I frozen? Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you now. <laughs> okay, so um, California lichens, the last two I would recommend. 
Okay, I think we got the last one. Maybe you could also email me those just in case mm -hmm. we didn't catch those names um, and I can include them in the email. I think I can put it in the chat also. Okay, great. Um, okay, I can answer this question from Evelyn. Will there be a recording so we can watch and listen again? Yes, Evelyn, There we are recording all sessions. Um, I forgot to mention that at the beginning, I believe but we are recording the sessions. Um, they'll be password protected on our website, but if you are registered for this webinar, you will be getting an email from us um, either tomorrow or Friday that has the link in the password. Okay, and then um, another question from Miles here. Are there, are any of the lichens we saw today listed as rare slash special on CNPS or CNDDB? that we saw today can you guys hear me you were breaking up How about can you hear me susie oh yeah you you guys froze too for me um now can you hear me okay i can hear your voice your your picture is no. a little uh oh <laughs> okay um none of the lichens we saw today <laughs> Maybe I should just answer it in the chat. Okay, I heard I heard that none of the lichens we saw today, so none are of special concern. It sounds like, but there are some in our area. Bri Brioria spirillifera, or uh, it has a spiral feature to it, is one is one of the listed lichens, and that does occur at Lanfear. Okay. We caught all that. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so a question from uh, Natalia. What is your favorite lichen? Ooh, that's a hard question. There are so many, but, but I think I, really, I think one of the most great that I showed earlier. And um, can you guys still hear me? Um, maybe it'll help if you turn your video off. I don't know if that'll help your streaming potentially. I will try that. Because sometimes your audio is working, but your video is not working great. Oh, and now it okay. Can... How about? Yeah, you actually, look two of my favorite lichens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's is seems... that helping? Yeah, I, we can hear okay. you. Okay, great. Well, um, one lichen that I didn't get to talk is this uh, little mushroom looking one on the left in my profile photo there and it is um, lichen omphalia umbellifera and it is a basidio lichen and I didn't go into this but it's very different from all the lichens we saw today but fruiting body looks just like a mushroom but the primary thallus is just like a layer of algae on the log and the fungal hyphae, the fungal strands just weave in and out algae and absorb the nutrients, the sugars from it, and then grow up that mushroom. So that's a cool one. And then another, my other favorite is probably the very graceful Spherophorus tuckermanii, that one, the coral lichen, that sort of peach colored coral lichen. And I also really love the dark, um, the peltigeras that have the cyanobacteria in them. And that's it. I definitely thought that was a mushroom in your photo. So I'm glad that that question was asked and we got to learn that little secret that that is not a mushroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we have a question from Dawn about, but would it be possible to get a PDF of the slides from your presentation? Um, I will repeat that we are going to have the video, but um, I'll leave that one up to you. Um, but Dawn, we will have the video available after this if you want to rewatch um, to see the video. Yeah, I could possibly do that. And maybe I would, um, maybe you can connect with Susie and give her your email and then we could email and I could send them, send that PDF to you. Great. Yeah, we do have everybody's emails for sure. So. And one last question. Um, where did you study lichens? 
Oh, that was at the awesome uh, university, Humboldt State University. And I was in the botany department there. And um, I learned from, and that I, I mentioned her at the end, Marie Antoine was a wonderful professor. The class was lichens and bryophytes. And it was an awesome class. I loved the structure of it. And, and Marie's enthusiasm really came through and, and helped that. Um, and I had also taken a class in mycology, which helped me understand um, a lot more of it. And then since then, I've participated in a couple of trainings um, through the Northwest Lichen Society and the California Lichen Society also has uh, provided a lot of cool resources and education and field trips and, and whatnot. Great. Um, okay, so as Daisy said, this is the last question. We had two more questions typed in. <laughs> so we have two more questions now. Um, one from no Jessica. Um, from Jessica, how long do how long do lichens live? Oh, that's a great question. And it, it really varies. Um, lichen, I don't know what the oldest lived lichen is, but they can live a very long time and they are used often in dating things. So if you have like tombstones as a good example, know what year the tombstone was put down and you can look at a, a crust of lichen growing on a tombstone and then compare it to the same lichen in a nearby environment. And you can say, oh, well, this is how old that lichen is. There, there is more that go to the lichen dating that I don't know about, but um, they definitely can be very old. That's and uh, you may, maybe let me add on to that. Actually, I just thought of something else, but um, part of why they can be so long lived is that they can go dormant very easily. So especially like in the desert or in Antarctica, when conditions are unfavorable, the lichens just sort of shut down and can just hang out for a very, very long time until conditions become favorable again. So as soon as that the moisture returns or the temperature becomes the right temperature for them, the photobiont to start photosynthesizing again, then they can keep growing. And then it becomes crappy conditions again and they'll shut down and just wait. And so they don't, they don't really have a lifespan the way um, you know, animals do. <laughs> and so, you know, plants, it's a little complicated too, but yeah. It's so incredible. <laughs> okay, so maybe this is going to be our last question. <laughs> um, so Steph asked, uh, what reagents do you usually bring with you when you want to identify lichens? Oh, that's a tough one. You might have stumped my, my memory on that. Um, there are three chemical reagents, and one of them is household bleach. And so that's an easy one to come by. And I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the names of the other two, but I would be happy to email that information to you. And it's um, one of them is actually very toxic. And so it has, and it has to be stored um, in the dark, you need to wear gloves and dispose of anything you use of the proper way. So it's helpful if it's in a laboratory at a university where they can, they have their um, hazardous waste disposal. So you have to be really careful with, um, with one of them. And I'm, don't remember what the third one is, but um, they're not all three are, are super easy to identify. Oh, and there's a third, a fourth way, and um, that is important is UV light. So shining UV light on lichens, and sometimes you have to um, crack open and sort of peel back the, the cortex to get into the inner part, which I didn't tell you earlier, but it's called the medulla. And same with the chemical test, you have to take a, you take a toothpick and you touch it to the chemical and then you touch it to the medulla and you'll see a color change or not. And so in the keys and like these books I mentioned earlier, it will say, you know, has bushy rhizines. Oh, I guess I could think of KOH, potassium hydroxide. That's one of them. <laughs> and um, it was, so it'll say KOH negative or KOH orange plus red. It will, that's what it will say in the key. And so when you touch the little chemical, it will make that color change. And then UV light, it will, some of them have UV, like UV light reactions and other ones don't. Cool. Now I definitely want to carry a UV light with me when I go out to check out lichens, um, yeah, which I but... do apparently because. <laughs> and there's, there are other good reasons too. There are centipedes to look at or millipedes, I think that photofluoresce. There's a lot of organisms that 
um, UV light reacts on. Cool. Yeah, there was, I mean, there were some lichens in your photos that I just feel like I've never seen. And I go to the dunes really often. Um, <laughs> so I need to go back and keep an eye out for some of these lichens. Also, I mean, I use that powdered sugar joke on high schoolers. Um, so <laughs> Hopefully none of the high schoolers that are going to be coming on my field trips were watching this webinar. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, well, what they should know is that it's very delicious sweet powdered sugar. <laughs> right. <laughs> give it a lick. <laughs> Definitely give it a lick. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here, L'Oreal. That was officially our last question. Um, yeah, I was just going to say I'm sad. I had to turn off your video there, but it was also kind of interesting to be taught about lichens from a picture of lichens. <laughs> that was a new experience. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, we really appreciate your expertise. Um, that was so much great information. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, I hope that you're going to join us next week. Um, we're talking about pinnipeds of the California coast. That should be a really interesting talk. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, I said that, but I'm just very excited. To have <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being Thank myself. You Thank you, everybody. Thanks Thank for you. listening. Take thanks care. Bye. Um, have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>